Once Dendera was one of the most ancient cities in the capital of the sixth known, or, as they would say now, the region of Egypt. Every year thousands of Egyptians flocked here to give praise to their beloved god S. Hathor. Curiously, it was mostly women who revered her. The keepers of the hearth came to the temple, the main attraction of Dendera, to ask for help if the family had no children, or to obtain this support in the upcoming birth. The temple at Dendera was built in the 1st century BC, in the Greco-Roman era, and, admittedly, well preserved to this day. An interesting feature, the Dendera temple at the same time contains both images of Roman emperors and Egyptian gods. Temple Hathor stretched in length by 79 meters and is surrounded by a brick wall. The interior consists of hypostyle and Hellenistic halls. On the roof of the temple there are sacred prayers. Roman emperors from Augustus to Nero are depicted on the walls of the hypostyle, more simply, columna, hall, and the ceiling is decorated with heavenly bodies. To climb to the roof to the preserved sanctuary chapels, you can choose both straight and spiral staircases. The walls of the temple everywhere are decorated with reliefs depicting processions in honor of the gods, including livelihoods of the deities themselves. By the way, in one of the sanctuaries dedicated to Osiris, if you believe the historians, you can admire the world's first zodiac calendar. The most courageous and brave can descend into the underground crypts of the temple in Dendera. But this should be done only with a guide or his assistants. Since there are many narrow chambers in the crypts, and the entrances to them are located not just anywhere, but right in the floors of the rooms. Hathor Temple is built of sandstone, has a length of almost 80 meters and is surrounded by a high brick wall. Inside is a large hypostyle hall with 24 columns, on which are carved images of Hathor. Astronomical symbols can be seen on the ceiling of the hall, Pharaoh's visit to the temple is described on the walls. Hathor Temple is also famous for the so-called lamp denders bas reliefs. The goddess Hathor, the daughter of the sun god Amun-Ra, was for the inhabitants of ancient Egypt the personification of femininity, love and motherhood. Her home was a stunningly beautiful temple, known since C3 century BC and repeatedly rebuilt. He performed his functions for 500 years. Behind the magnificent gate is the temple courtyard. A little further is the covered column hall, the front of which is open to sunlight. Each column here resembles a citra, the sacred musical instrument of the goddess Hathor, the sounds of which accompany the singing of the temple choir. The goddess Hathor herself was firmly associated in the minds of the inhabitants of ancient Egypt with the sky. 
and this connection is reflected in the multitude of astronomical images on the ceiling of the main column hall of the temple. Until now, the drawings of the planets, constellations, zodiac signs and illustrations, telling about the passage of the Golden Rook of Ra through midday and midnight, have retained their color. The central passage of the second column hall leads to the heart of the Temple of Hathor, the sanctuary of the goddess. The capitals of the six columns of the hall are made in the form of lotus flowers and papyrus, from which the four-faced goddess herself appears, the patroness of the four cardinal points. Each time during the celebration of the new year, the statue of the goddess Hathor was carried out into the light of the sun. The priests placed it in the Ubert, a special cleansing chapel, located a little distance from the sanctuary. After the ritual of purification, the statue was carried to the roof of the temple. Here Hathor was reunited with the divine rays of her father Amon Ra. However, the most valuable divine images, pictures and symbols were never taken out of special premises, crypts. Currently, the temple, Hathor has 15 crypts arranged in tiers. In these rooms, most often located underground, not only the sacred attributes of the cult were kept but also secret rites and ceremonies were held. The date of creation of the round Dendera zodiac can be determined with rather great accuracy, since both the ancient Egyptian and ancient Greek symbols of the starry sky are present in it, which gives grounds to date it in the 1st century AD. BC. To date, there are several hundred versions of the date fixed on the round Dendera zodiac. Decoding is complicated by the fact that nowadays scientists cannot identify all Egyptian symbols of the Dendera zodiac with specific stars with a significant degree of certainty, which gives rise to many versions. The most original version of the decoding of the meaning of the round Dendera zodiac can be considered the theory proposed by the Russian researcher Viktor Trapkin. He proves that the zodiac doesn't depict the date of a certain apocalypse, but the image of the starry sky from the porthole of an interstellar ship on that day and hour when it was near the Earth, on which people have not yet appeared, that is, the zodiac recorded the date of birth of human civilization. It was the French who first became interested in the buildings of Dandera. Since the beautiful drawings of the Temple of Hathor, made by artists during Napoleon's Egyptian campaign in 1798-1801, were preserved, and their compatriot Jean-Francois Champollion, 1790-1832, was already able to read the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs.
The landmark of Cairo is the Stowe Chapel of Pharaoh Mentu Hotep the First, 11 Dynasty, circa 2133-2117 BC, installed in front of the Cairo Museum, was found on the territory of the Hathor Temple Complex. On the walls of Hathor Temple, numerous inscriptions testify to the protection of the Roman emperors in Egypt, the relief of Cleopatra, Julius Caesar and their son Caesarian. The names of emperors Augustus, Nero, Tiberius, Caligula, the names and images of Caligula, Claudia and Nero and at the entrance to the temple are the names of Domitian and Trajan. British archaeologist William Pitre, 1853-1942, the founder of modern systematic Egyptology, during excavations at the Dendera Necropolis, discovered a separate necropolis with mummies of animals and birds, falcons, gazelles, snakes, acnumens, Egyptian mangooses, and cats. The custom of animal burial has been preserved in Dendera until the era of the Ptolemies and the Roman emperors. From Dendera by private transport we moved to Luxor where we visited the Karnak Temple. The Karnak Temple, located near Luxor, is the largest and most ancient temple complex on the planet. It stretched over 200 hectares and its area is 105 kilometers by 0.8 kilometers. 
The square of the sacred hall of the god Amin Ra alone is about 61 acres, which is several times larger than the area of any of the European cathedrals. Karnak is an entire temple city whose age is thousands of years old. Pylons, sanctuaries, temples, statues and obelisks were erected by the rulers of the land of the pyramids for 2,000 years. On the internet you can find photos of the Karnak temple, made from a bird's eye view, the size of the complex is truly enormous. For many centuries, the temple of Amun Ra at Karnak was the main sanctuary of ancient Egypt. He was also the residence of the rulers, and the treasury, and the administrative center, and the heart of Thebes, then the capital of Egypt. Today this place is listed in the UNESCO World Cultural Heritage List. The Temple of Karnak in Luxor includes several buildings surrounded on all sides by a 20-meter wall. These are the temples of the Great Amun Ra, Ptah, Khonsu, Ipt, Monto, Osiris and the destroyed temple of Amenhotep IV. The second name of the Karnak complex is the House of Amun. As it was originally erected in honor of the cult of the supreme Egyptian deity, the god of the sun Ra. The introduction of the cult of this mythological character in the culture and history of ancient Egypt began during the reign of the 12th dynasty of the pharaohs. When the city of Thebes became the capital of the state, Initially, Amun Ra was depicted as a goose, then a ram, and at the peak of worship, as a man with feathers on his head. Today, photos of images of this deity are easy to find in online sources. The Egyptians gave the name, El Karnak, to the Temple of Karnak, which means, fortified village. When conquering Egypt to the entrance to the complex, they discovered a lot of buildings that were not affected by time. At the entrance to the Temple of Karnak, the Sphinx Ali is located, which guarded the religious building. The Ali with 20 animals, having the body of a lion and the head of a ram, was built during the reign of Pharaoh Nectanaba of 30 dynasties. The Karnak Temple was erected in such a way that the most ancient rooms are located in the center, and as you move away from it there are buildings of more and more recent eras. This is explained by the fact that each new section of the temple was attached to an increasingly later ruler of Egypt. The first hall of the Karnak complex covers an area of 100 by 80 meters. Its construction was completed during the reign of the 22nd dynasty of the pharaohs. All tourists entering the hall are offered to pay attention to the majestic columns decorated with papyrus buds, a symbol of royal power. On the left there are three chapels, erected by Pharaoh Seti II in honor of the conquest of Thebes. On the right is the temple of Ramses III. It consists of small rooms and a hypostyle hall, through which you can reach the shrine of the Temple of Karnak. Unfortunately, these premises have not spared time, now they are badly damaged. The hypostyle hall of the Temple of Karnak leads to another room of the complex, built by Amenhotep III. From here there is also a view of the Thutmose Sai Hall, where there are two obelisks of which only one survived. Obelisks and the colonnade of the Thutmose I Hall were erected a little later, after the only female pharaoh of Egypt, Hatshepsut, ascended to the throne. Only one of the two colonnades of this hall is well preserved, it is made of red granite, its size is 29.5 meters in height, 322 tons in weight. After the death of Queen Hatshepsut, Pharaoh Thutmose III erected a high wall around the two obelisks, apparently in order to hide and preserve them. He also built the fifth pylon of the Temple of Karnak, 
It houses a granite sanctuary dedicated to the boat Amon Ra. Behind the sanctuary is a wide courtyard. To the left of the 6th hall of the Karnak complex is the courtyard of the 7th pylon. Here are the statues of Ramses II and Thutmose III. The next, 8th pylon was erected by Queen Hatshepsut and decorated with Thutmose III and then restored by Network I between the 9th and 10th pylons. The remains of the Hatshep Sanctuary, which was erected by Amenhotep II and adorned with Seti I, open to the gaze of tourists. The 9th pylon is today heavily damaged. He belonged to the temple of the god Aten, as Amun Ra was called under Pharaoh Akhenaten and was destroyed by later rulers who tried to erase from the history of Egypt all references to the pharaoh heretic who built it. The Karnak temple ends with a tenth pylon built during the reign of pharaoh Hormeb. It includes the gate of Ptolemy II, located in the front of the Mut temple. Leaving the temple of Amun at Karnak, do not forget to visit the sacred lake dating back to the times of Thutmose III and be sure to take a photo of him. The sacred lakes were in many Egyptian temples, but the lake at Karnak is the largest of them. It was used for celebrations, deities were supposed to sail on it in the Golden Barge. Initially, water was supplied to Lake Karnak from the Nile, but at the moment it is fed exclusively from groundwater. Its size is 80 by 40 meters. Near the lake is the Holy Scarab, the largest in Egypt since the reign of Amenhotep III. For the Egyptians, this insect was the personification of the sun. There is a legend that if you go around the beetle seven times and make a wish, it will come true, at least the Egyptians believe in this.
In antiquity, Luxor was divided into two parts, the land of the living and the land of the dead. So from the land of the living to the land of the dead, we swam in a boat, crossing the Nile. Not far from the historical Pearl of Egypt, Luxor, on the edge of the desert rise two gigantic statues, known to the world as the Colossi of Memnon. For thousands of years they have been guarding a huge plain that was once the memorial temple of Amenhotep III. Hatshepsut Temple is located at the base of the Deir el Bari cliff. Photos of his easy to find on the internet. This temple complex, located in Luxor, in many respects differs from the temples of other rulers of ancient Egypt. The tomb of Queen Hatshepsut was as non-trivial as the person herself and the appearance on the political and historical scene of the only female pharaoh of the land of the pyramids. Queen Hatshepsut is the daughter of Pharaoh Thutmosis I and his wife Jalmes, as well as the half-sister and the wife of Thutmosis II. His reign lasted about seven years, and he managed to leave the heir, Thutmos III, his son, from another woman. After the death of the ruler Thutmosis III was still very young and could not lead the country. 
and the hatship suit became regent with a minor ruler. However, pride and vanity did not allow her to become only the governor, and soon the woman declared herself the sole sovereign of the Egyptian state. And those 15 years that she stood at the helm of Egypt became one of the most impressive pages in the history of the 18 dynasty. Under the leadership of Hatshepsut, successful military campaigns took place in Asia and Nubia, and in the ninth year of her reign, a famous expedition took place from Egypt to Punt. The exact location of this mysterious country is still unknown. It is possible that this is territory of modern Somalia. During the reign of this wise and active ruler, many churches and monuments were erected, very few of whom spared time. This woman was unusual in all its manifestations, and her funerary temple complex in Luxor is just as original. The temple is located at a considerable distance from the buildings of other kings. Erected in the Theban necropolis, on the border of the desert and fertile land, a huge pylon was erected, from which the path to the temple passed. The temple itself of Queen Hatshepsut is a real engineering marvel that architects of ancient Egypt were capable of. It was created in the limestone rocks of Deir el-Bari and included three large terraces that were located one above the other. On each of the terraces there was a courtyard, rooms with columns and shrines that went far into the thickness of the rock. On the walls of the Temple of Hatshepsut in Luxor are depicted reliefs that fully reflect the attitude of the inhabitants of the land of the pyramids. On the walls of the southern part of the lower portico painted delivery of obelisks, which were intended for the construction of the Temple of Amun in Karnak. On the walls of the northern portico depicted scenes, which take place in the reed thickets associated with Lower Egypt. The idea of uniting the upper and lower lands of Egypt slips once more on the railing railing that connects the second and third tiers of the Hatshepsut temple. At the bottom, these stairs are decorated with the image of a huge cobra, whose tail rises along the top of the railing. This serpent is the personification of the goddess Wajit, the patroness of Lower Egypt. Above her head is an image of Horus, one of the most important deities of Upper Egypt. Ancient poets called Egypt the gift of Nile, indeed, the fate of this country has always been closely connected with its main waterway. For many millennia, the annual floods of the Nile determined the rhythm of life of the Egyptians. Every year at the same time the water level in the Nile rose, bringing fertile silt to the fields. Thanks to this river, one of the most ancient civilizations of the world was born. The entire Nile Valley is a gigantic oasis. Egypt is a gift of the Nile, as ancient Greek writers rightly claimed. After all, the main feature of this river are annual spills. By mid-July, the water began to arrive, reaching its highest level in the autumn, when the river flooded huge coastal areas. On this flooded land besieged silt brought by the river from its headwaters. All the fertile soil of the Nile Valley consists of fertile sediments of river silt. She easily gave in to processing and differed exceptional fertility. Thanks to these features, conditions in the Nile Valley favored the development of agriculture. Already from the time of the Neolithic, the settlers of this valley possessed the necessary tools for working soft Nile soil. They soon turned to agricultural production.
O'Neill, no doubt, played a major role in the life of the country. Prosperity and well-being of the country depended on it. Therefore, many gods and myths about them were associated with Nile. In the Egyptian view, the Nile flowed not only on earth, through the world of people, but also through the sky and the underworld. The inhabitants themselves identified the river with the god Happy. It was he who was responsible for the annual spill of the Nile and the saturation of the land with fertile silt. Another Nile deity was Sebek, the living personification of which was the crocodile. He was the god of water and spill, the protector of people and gods. Despite such a repulsive appearance, Sebek was not a cruel god. Together with Osiris, he was worshipped as a fertility god. He was also the master of fresh water and all living things in the river. Hunters and fishermen prayed to him, who were fishing in the thickets of the Nile. He is credited with inventing fishing nets. One of the most popular gods, Osiris, was associated with Nile. He was a symbol of the productive forces of nature. Sowing grain into fertile soil symbolized the death of Osiris, and the growth of plants symbolized the resurrection of God. In addition to Osiris, a number of fertility deities were associated with Neil, the great god Ra, the king and father of the gods. The god of the sun, every day makes his way along the heavenly Nile on the barge. Thus, it illuminates the earth. In the evening, Ra is transplanted into the barge Masixit, and in it she makes a further journey through the underground world. Already in the morning, having overcome the serpent Apophis, Ra reappears on the horizon. Thus, in the Egyptian view, the heavenly and underground Nile also symbolize the firmament with the alternation of day and night. The extensive mythology of ancient Egypt speaks of the great influence of the Nile on the worldview of the Egyptians. It affected the enormous influence of the river on their daily lives. After all, without Nile, there is no life. Therefore, the gods are so often associated with him. Over the long millennia of human history, the Nile carries its life-giving waters in the desert. Without this river, one of the greatest civilizations of the world would not have been born. Without the Nile, Egypt has become a lifeless dry desert. Even in modern times, he continues to play an important role in the life of the country. This is the main transport artery, the main source of fresh water, Without Nile, there would be no farming, despite modern technology. The construction of the Aswan Dam made it possible to regulate the waters of the Nile and contributed to the further development of agriculture. But at the same time the annual floods of this river have stopped and this means that the country has lost fertile Nile silt. It also depends on the ecosystem of the Mediterranean Sea for the inhabitants of which these sediments were an excellent forage base. But the historical significance of the Nile continues to persist. Every year thousands of tourists come to Egypt to get acquainted with the outstanding monuments of antiquity. Someone comes on a tour to get acquainted with the ancient temples and grand tombs. And someone buys a cruise on the Nile.